What sparked your career in fusion power? When I was a junior a physics major in college, uh, I came across a book called Project Sherwood by Amasa Bishop, who was the first head of the U.S. fusion program and uh, served that in that capacity in the 50s and wrote this book in 1958, part of the declassification of fusion worldwide at the second U.N. conference on the peaceful uses of atomic energy. And it seemed to me like this was a uh, an area uh, in which one could make a difference in the world if uh, it came to pass and was successful and which was in a very early stage and though as a young person uh, looking for a place in which to make a career in physics type stuff and uh, so that's what first got me interested in it and it sort of I sort of took it from there and went to graduate school in there and everything else sort of followed from that but that was sort of the initial you needed something to sustain your your interest in the field over this period of time you've been in fusion for decades and you've been a major advocate for fusion research across the US and, and in many parts of the world. So what kept it going for you? I was fortunate enough to get some great career opportunities. You know, when you uh, go to graduate school and then you get your degree, then you've got to get a job. And you may get a good job, you may not get a good job, you get no job and you may have to switch fields. And so I was lucky enough uh, when I got my uh, master's degree at uh, MIT to actually get a job working in the uh, fusion office at the Atomic Energy Commission in Washington. And so that sort of set me right in the center of things and at a very early stage in my career, gave me the opportunities to travel around to all the sites, uh, both nationally and internationally that were working on fusion. and meeting the best people in the field. And so, you know, my interest in the field uh, got solidified by that early opportunity to do that kind of work. And then while I was doing that, I got my PhD at uh, Maryland in physics. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, I was fortunate enough, that was now in the early 70s, I was fortunate enough to be uh, at the Atomic Energy Commission in the fusion office when the energy crisis hit. And, we had gasoline lines and everything, and Richard Nixon and then Jimmy Carter decided that uh, the government should expand all their work in energy. So, you know, our budget started to grow. So I was able, again, to be fortunate enough in my career to be right there when the budget went up from like $30 million a year to $300 million a year. So it was a very exciting time. We built lots of new facilities. And I also was given the opportunity to lead a community planning study that we published in uh, 1976 that said uh, we could get the fusion by the year 2000 for $20 billion. And then in 1980, the Congress passed a bill codifying that into law, saying that we would do that. And Jimmy Carter signed that law. So, you know, at that point, I thought everything was really going according to plan. So I wanted to be right involved in it. So what I did was I left the government and I formed Fusion Power Associates with a couple of other people, Nick Crawl and uh, Al Chivalpiece. And we started what we hope would be uh, the beginnings of a, of a shift in emphasis in the program from labs and universities into industry to develop the technology and commercialize things by the year 2000. So. During the early 80s, uh, I was in that position of organizing the industries. That was all great. And then, of course, we had the uh, problem in the early 80s that uh, shortly after Jimmy Carter signed it into law, Ronald Reagan was elected president. And he said, well, it isn't the government's job to do energy. It's the private sector. And so we didn't know quite what to do. And so there was uh, several years there in the early 80s where I didn't know whether to quit or, you know, what was going to happen. And just maybe as I was about to lose hope, because I was losing all our industrial participants in Fusion Power Associates, just as uh, one might have given up, Ronald Reagan made peace with the Gorbachev in 1987, and they agreed to build the first fusion reactor, <laughs> which was eventually called ITER. And that didn't allow me then to quit at that point, so I got really interested and thought things were really going to go now. And then there were ups and downs in the 90s where things started to go. 
you know, where there were committees that said, yeah, fusion was important, let's do it. And then there were budget crises in Congress where things got shut down. And that led us into the early 2000s when we finally rejoined ITER. And, uh, you know, so all along the way, whenever things sort of got bad, a few years later, things started looking up again. So I never lost hope. You know, I hung in there. I read your book, Search for the Ultimate Energy Source. It sort of laid out this cycle that I think you kind of talk about, where a new administration would come in, they want a review of all the fusion work that has been done, where we are, where we need to go. So they raise this panel, the panel does a review, they write a report, usually takes maybe 12 to, to 24 months. The report recommends more funding or a diversification of funding or a change in funding or the funding structure, and then it kind of gets ignored maybe a little bit or gets sidelined or gets kind of passed over until the next administration comes in and they do sort of the same thing over again. That's the way I would characterize it. I don't know if you would characterize it like that. What do you think about that? There were changes of administration from time to time. You know, we had Republicans for a while, and then we had Democrats for a while, and then we went back to Republicans for a while. And they do always question what the previous administration thinks is important and come up with their own thing that they think was important. The energy programs went up and down with that, but the energy programs never really got endorsed by any of the administrations the way it was endorsed in the 70s, where the government said, we're going to become energy independent and we got to really do all of these energy programs seriously. And I think one of the reasons for that was, and still is, that we've never had an energy crisis like we had in the 70s. We've always had as much imported oil as we seem to need. You know, there were times when people said, well, it's not an energy fuel problem, but it's a global warming problem. And, you know, various groups said, well, that's important. And other groups said, well, we don't believe in it. So we've never been able to get everybody on board on both parties to say we've got to develop a uh, carbon free energy source and fusion is a, a good bet. And, and it's going to cost a lot more money than we're putting into it. And Let's do it. The, cl the closest thing we've come to it is ITER, and that happened because Gorbachev, the Russians and the U.S., and then they got the French involved at a high level. They said, this is a very important area, but it's very expensive, and none of us wants to pay to do it by ourselves. And so let's get a lot of countries together to do it together, and they formed the seven parties, if you count Europe as one, to do fusion. And so fusion became a thing not for the U.S., but for the world to decide to do as an international venture. And so U.S. then sort of said, well, we're just a part of that. You know, we don't have to have our own policy to develop fusion, and therefore we don't really need to put a lot more money into it right away, and uh, we'll watch and see how this international thing goes. And so that's what's been happening the last almost 15 years now. There doesn't seem to be a groundswell within the U.S. to do it ourselves. We just watch the international committees, and they're doing is building this big 500 megawatt thermal fusion power plant, which is a substantial step forward for fusion if they get it built and operating. You can't say that just because the fusion policy ebbed and flowed here in the U.S. that it wasn't moving forward. It was moving forward, but it was moving forward slowly under the guise of an international venture. You have seen uh, interest in fusion come and go, and you talked about the oil crisis being a real high point. I guess there's got to be ways to ride the enthusiasm and then bring up enthusiasm when enthusiasm is low in the public sphere, in the private sector, in government, in educational systems, in universities, whatever. Any advice on how to do that? I think the only way that we get the attention in the public is when we have a major step forward. And unfortunately, to do that, you only have these major step forwards when you bring on a new facility that's got more capability than the facilities you've had in the past, and that's been very hard to come by in the last 20 years. ITER is the first machine that's being built that can outperform the machines like TFTR and JET 
that we built in the 80s. There have been a couple of uh, false alarms put out by people who claim to have solved the fusion program, and, and this got a lot of publicity. So you can see that there's an appetite for this information, but the only people that have put out these great claims have been people who were not able to then follow up with proof. We have a real problem with public relations and getting the attention of the Congress or the public in a way that says that they ought to accelerate the program. What we've devolved into is a situation where we have broad support for a continuation of the program, but as a part of the international, you know, sort of an attitude developed that, well, fusion's a long way off, and every time people said it was going to be faster, it didn't turn out that way. Therefore, let's do it, but let's just take our time and go about it kind of a snail space. That's the situation we're in. Uh, the only thing that's demanding a lot more money and a lot more acceleration is ITER. Unfortunately, it's demanding a lot more money for a even slower schedule than what they were originally on. So uh, we don't have a horse to ride, if I might put it that way. Both the Koreans and the Europeans did have, and they are reevaluating, re a plan to build power plant, demonstration power plant by the year 2050. And with the slippage in the eater schedule, it's probably going to slip 10 years. There are other countries that are planning ahead for power. But the U.S. policy has been for maybe 15 years or more that we'll just do the science and we'll let the other countries do the engineering and the power plants. And once they've built the first one, then our industry will come in and steal all the technology and outdo them somehow. That seems to be the attitude. And that attitude is mostly driven by budget because they don't want to spend a lot more money than it would take for the U.S. to run an aggressive program. And it's partly driven by policy because with the present administration for the last eight years, the, the emphasis has been on the renewables and solar and wind, and the attitude has been that those are near term. We know they work even though they're not producing a lot of power, but uh, let's ride that horse because they're carbon free. And that's where their public relations goes. That's where their lobbying goes. That's where their emphasis goes for funding. Now, when the Republicans were in, they were dominated by the fossil fuel industries, the, the coal industries, the gasoline, the oil industries, and the nuclear fission industries. And so, again, if they had their way, if they wanted to put more money into energy, which they didn't necessarily want to because their policy was cut federal spending because of the deficits. So the conservative basis of the Republican Party doesn't really want the government in the business of spending a lot of money on developing new energy sources. So we don't have a champion, I guess. We have support from both parties, but we don't have a champion in either party. You talked about claims. This field has had people come forward in the past that have claimed that they have fusion breakthroughs. How do you deal with that? What are the good sides of that? You mentioned publicity. What are the bad sides of that? Well, probably the most famous one was the Hans and Fleischmann cold fusion thing in the 80s. You know, it got on the cover of Time magazine, on the cover of Newsweek, all the newspapers. There was a congressional hearing with television cameras there. I was actually on the CBS Evening News shortly after that broke. People like Edward Teller even came out and said, well, maybe it's possible. <laughs> there was no obvious way that it could have been possible to do this. Basically, it's something that looked like a car battery in your kitchen without high temperature. You know, from the normal physics, there didn't seem to be any way that that could be possible. But, you know, Edward Teller came out and said, well, maybe there's a tunneling effect of some sort, you know, some kind of quantum effect that had never been seen before, and there's no physics for it yet, but there will be. So there were a lot of people, both in our program and, and elsewhere. You know, I consulted for one of the oil companies who believed this might be real. And since the oil companies have research laboratories with a lot of chemists, and these guys were chemists, they all jumped on the bandwagon and tried to do it. So there were a lot of people, and the government itself at the national laboratories tried to duplicate these things. So there were an awful lot of attempts to duplicate this effect in the U.S. and around the world, and uh, nobody could duplicate it. But nevertheless, it was a huge public relations event that brought fusion to the attention of the American people. And people still, when they call me and talk to me about fusion, always bring up, is coal fusion still a possibility and is it still alive and so on? You know, the good thing was that a lot of people were open-minded enough to think, well, maybe it's possible, even it seems like it isn't. So when people make these claims, if they got any kind of credentials at all, people don't discount them totally anymore. 
There will always be scientists that will say, well, no, these people are stupid. It can never work. And so you can find people who will say that. But you can also usually find people who say, no, let, let's take a look at it. You know, there's good and bad there, but it's not all bad. I think that it's healthy that there are entrepreneurs out there that try to do it a different way, try to do it a simpler way or a cheaper way or a faster way. Because the truth is that fusion is taking too long and the Eater Tokamak project is too expensive and it's taking too long. And so, you know, there's room for a breakthrough. And uh, there are, as you probably know, and in fact, I know you do know, probably a half a dozen or more of these ideas. Most of them are evolutions of things that are fairly old, that have been around for a while and were thought of early days and maybe dropped because we didn't know enough or didn't have the technology that people are revisiting. So there are possibilities out there that I think deserve to be pursued, but we're in the situation where with the demands of money for the tokamak and for Eater and for the reluctance of the government to spend more money on almost anything, there's a policy that the government's not going to fund these things. Some of these people have gotten private money, and that's great, and it goes along for a while, but then the private sector money usually runs out either because they didn't get the breakthrough as fast as they had hoped for their money or they didn't get what they hoped to get for their money or the people come back and say, well, we did some nice work, but we need even more money. And then sometimes the private sector people say, we can't keep up in your budget. There are a host of approaches or ideas, and they run the gamut from just stuff people threw out on paper all the way up to things like Tokamak, which have a whole huge body of work trained scientists and, and years and years and years of data to back up their success. I think it's a whole spectrum from one side to the other. But the tokamak seems to get most of the funding, and it gets results, which then you get more funding. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is the tokamak a good idea, or is it the idea that we feel the most confident about? It's the concept that has had the most success. No other concept has had the performance success that the, even the small early tokamaks had that created what was called in one of the reviews a bandwagon effect around the world. When the Russians got good confinement in the tokamak, when most everybody else over here was looking to try to do it in stellarators and magnetic mirrors, which didn't have good confinement, and all of a sudden the Russians had good confinement, everybody started building tokamaks. And all these tokamak turned out to get good results. People built bigger ones. And so all around the world, people kept building bigger and bigger ones, and they all seemed to work, and they all worked better. We got things like the ideal ignition temperature was achieved in the tokamak for the first time. The Lawson criterion for energy balance of density times the confinement time was achieved in the only time in the world in the tokamak. Because they kept building new ones and bigger ones and better ones, they kept getting more performance. And nothing else, even when these things were being funded a little bit, nothing else was getting this kind of performance. So right now we're in a situation where 90% of the scientists working in the world are all tokamak people. And so it's very hard now for these other ideas to catch on because one group or one person comes up with a good idea, he's not credible enough all by himself or the group all by itself to get funding. You have to have enough credibility and enough good arguments and physics basis to get other people to, to get on. You know, you need to get something to come out and then maybe two or three other universities jump on this bandwagon or a couple of laboratories or somebody else in another country. And you know, you've got to have more than just yourself if you're an advocate. Otherwise, even if you got a good idea, you're not taken seriously if you can't convince a whole bunch of your peers to, to get on board with you. I agree with that. I think that's a very fair assessment of the situation. Maybe we should take a step back for a minute and talk about what would be the ideal environment for fusion. What would be the best way that we could support not just the tokamaks, but a whole host of ideas in the U.S.? What would be your ideal budget for fusion research? Well, I think what has to be done is you have to get support for fusion, mostly from the government until it's a little bit closer to commercialization and you can attract private investment. But the only way I think we can get the government to, uh, to do this at the level at which it needs to be done is if you sort of take it out of the annual arguments over the federal budget, all of which always has a deficit. 
And one way to do that, I think, is to put like a five cent tax on a gallon of gas. And because of the very, very large billions of gallons of gas that are purchased every year, you would create a huge amount of money. And if you set it up so that all that five cent tax on gas went into an energy R&D trust fund, just the way we have like the highway trust fund or the social security fund, but if you could do it in a way that didn't allow the Congress to come in and rob it every year to do something else, but you set it up so that that money had to be spent on developing energy technologies like fusion, you would have surplus money to do everything that you wanted to do it and do it aggressively. So I think the financial situation has to be changed in that way in order to be able to get the money. And if that happened, I think there are a lot of people out there that would love to see energy programs across the board have Manhattan space program type uh, crash programs. I think they would create a great rejuvenation of the American spirit to do that. We did it for the atomic bomb. We did it for the space program, but we haven't done anything like that since. And, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money to develop a lot of new energy sources because these facilities are not that cheap, but it's not an amount of money that can't easily be raised by a small tax. It could be a couple of mils per kilowatt hour on electricity. It could be a combination of that and a small gas tax of a few cents. I mean, there's a lot of ways to raise the money with a small tax, and I don't think people would mind paying that little bit of tax because right now the price of a gallon of gas goes up and down by a dollar or two from year to year. So go up by five cents, <laughs> nobody would even notice it. Looking forward, Fusion is never done in a vacuum. There's always reasons why we do it and reasons why we might not do it. You talked about the energy crisis in the 70s and that being a huge impetus to put money into energy research. Now, if you look forward five years, 10 years, 15 years, you're going to see a decrease in the amount of fossil fuels available just because we burn it up so fast. There is a finite amount. You'll see climate change becoming more and more powerful and important. And other things will be changing, too. Fusion research, how do you see it changing as the world changes? For a couple of decades now, I've been wondering, where is the next energy crisis? Because I went through the energy crisis in the 70s, and a lot of analysis was done then by the economists and the energy supply experts who said, you know, we're going to run out of, of oil within 10 years. And here we are, like, 30 years later, and we're not running out of oil yet. So... It's very hard to say what is going to be the catalyst for the next recognition that we need to do energy R&D and develop energy sources aggressively. If there were another oil crisis in which we really couldn't get the oil that we wanted, that would probably shake everybody up and create this kind of an impetus. There really was an environmental catastrophe that was so bad that everybody recognized that you could blame it on global warming, then this would happen. The politicians would jump on their bandwagon, they'd be clamoring for all the energy they could get that was carbon-free, and they'd throw money at it. Because I went through this in the 70s, and I saw it happen. So, But I don't know if that's going to happen in the next five years. You know, I don't know when that's going to happen, because I've been surprised over the last 30 years that it hasn't happened yet. It isn't happening this year, I can tell you that, because right now the oil is a glut. There's a glut of oil, and it's such a glut that the prices of a barrel of oil has gone down from like $100 to $30. There's no perception that there's a fuel problem. And right now, yes, there's some concerns that blame various thunderstorms and hot weather or rainy weather on climate change, but not a hard proof. You can't prove it that it's happening right now in such a way as to blame or tornadoes on it, even though some people will. One thing that Fusion needs is a workforce. It needs people who are enthusiastic about it, and they need opportunities and pathways into the field. In my story, I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to study for seven years to work on subsystems for the National Ignition Facility for my PhD. But many people don't have those opportunities. There needs to be better ways for people to get into fusion. I think the most exciting thing is the outgrowth of amateur fusers, kids building these fusers in their homes and garages, 
and then going to science fairs and winning. Do you see promise in that movement? Do you see that and maybe coupled with some other trends allowing people to get into this field or find ways into this field? I think these young people that we see doing various little projects that relate to fusion shows you that fusion still has the capability, the capacity to excite the imagination of young people that have a scientific event. They would love to get into fusion. But then they have to actually see an opportunity. And one of the things that people in universities keep telling me is that the, the students coming in in science and engineering are very astute in terms of getting their topics in areas that they think they're going to be able to get a job in that field. And so they look around and they see the students that are a few years ahead of them getting jobs and they talk to the advisors and they see what the growth industries are. And of course, in recent times, these growth industries have been in the uh, computer areas, the information technology areas, and more recently in a lot of the cyber warfare areas. And uh, they also see that fusion is kind of leveled off. They don't see it as a growth area. If it's not growing, then they know that the only openings are coming about when people retire. And there are people retiring, so there are always going to be some opportunities, but they're not going to be a large number. So the, the university programs are still, I mean, you know, they're not going great, but they're, they're still vibrant. There's still a lot of universities doing work in Fusion. There's still a lot of professors that are supported and have graduate students on small-scale things. So you can still find a university that'll that'll get you through to your PhD and, and so on. And then if you're good, you got at least a chance to get a job in one of the national labs in fusion, or you're probably well enough trained that you can get a job in the industry in a related field that's using plasma technology. So there's there's various routes. It's not like if the program were Going up 10, 20% a year, it's not going to have that kind of attraction to students thinking about what the best career opportunities are in terms of making a living. But it was there will still be opportunities for those people who get so turned on to fusion that they're willing to take the risk because they want to stay in fusion because fusion excites them and they can see how important it is. And there's still going to be people that are willing to take that risk. You've been head of the Fusion Power Associate since you founded it. Do you have any plans for the group going forward? Have you thought about a succession plan for who's going to take over when you eventually retire? I have not given it a lot of thought because I'm still healthy and interested in what I'm doing. And I have a board of directors, about 20 people, and they're the heads of laboratories and major university programs. And it'll be their job to figure out what to do when it's time for me to retire. They're going to have to find a person to take over, and they'll probably have a subcommittee of the board that will meet and have discussions of various people that could take over or various changes of direction. When that happens, I think it'll somewhat depend on how Peter goes in the next couple of months or years as to whether Fusion is going to lose even more support or whether it's going to continue on the path that it's on or whether it's going to diversify again and look for some new possibilities, they'll have to take all that into account. Because when I started Fusion Power Associates, my goal was to bring industry into the program. And that has started to work. But when the U.S. didn't continue on with commitment to build new facilities here and provide opportunities for industry to get into the program, I lost the industry. So now my association is almost all uh, laboratories and university. If we continue on the path that I'm on, and if that's the situation when I retire, that that's still the policy, uh, that there's no opportunity for our industry to really get involved, then they'll pick one sort of a person to continue, or they'll quit maybe. I don't know. Or if, if either is successful or if something else is successful, and if there's a policy change to allow industry to actually get supported by the government, try to get some big industries really up to speed on how to do fusion. The government could do a lot of things to attract industry in, like cost-sharing things. And industries would come in. They don't want to come in and say, we'd like to do fusion, and then have the government say, well, we don't support industry. 
So if there is an opportunity for industry, the industry people will come in. They might decide to shift the focus of Fusion Power Associates back towards uh, the industry and the development of engineering and power plant things. So I can't predict how that situation might be in two or three or four years. But eventually, it'll be our board of directors who will have to face up to that issue. The FPA has been a wonderful interface between the government and national laboratories, labs, universities, and other people who are interested. So thank you for running that body. It's done wonders for fusion funding over the last three decades. I'm coming to the end here. I don't really have too many more questions. Do you have anything that you'd like to add? Well, just that I know that you've been very active with respect to the, the blogosphere, for lack of a better term. It shows that uh, someone like yourself that wants to interact with the young people that are perhaps more open-minded to how things might evolve than the people who've spent their whole life in one concept can gather a following. And I think it's a very valuable service that you've performed over these years, and I think we could use more of that and hope that maybe a lot of people to do this kind of thing on the internet would follow your example and take off on stuff like that. And one of the things we've been doing the last several years in Fusion Power Associates is sponsor a group called the Coalition for Plasma Science. And one of the things that we've done as part of that is to give out science awards at these uh, science fairs. Although the judges were looking for people using plasmas for almost anything, it turned out that quite a few of the people that have won their plasma things were actually oriented towards fusion. You know, we've done a little bit to try to keep the younger people recognized in that regard, but there's a lot more can be done. Yeah, there's a lot more that can be done across the board. You know, I'll tell you one bad thing that's recently happened. Maybe it hasn't quite been canceled yet. The Division of Plasma Physics of the American Physical Society has an annual meeting, and for many years, they've had Teacher's Day. And uh, science teachers from the area where the meeting was being held were all contacted and invited to come for exhibits and things that were oriented towards students and to bring their class. And that's been going on for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. And that's one of the ways that the community as a whole has tried to get the high school level people interested. But the Department of Energy funded this mostly. And now in the past year, they've decided they're not going to provide money for that anymore. And this whole thing could die. And it shows you some of the short-sightedness in the government for the very small amount of money it took to run something like this once a year for science teachers and high school science students, you know, that they couldn't find a little bit of money or felt that, you know, it wasn't worth their money to do this. So it's very disappointing. We're trying to raise enough money elsewhere to, to get this all done. But it is an example of how the, the government has really let the program down. Well, I utilize all the tools of the web to get the word out. And fortunately for me, the internet is a wonderful information redistribution monster. The problem that I've encountered has been that the material infusion generally is locked up in peer-reviewed publications, which is very important. Peer review is, is essential. But making that user-friendly or accessible to high school students, teachers, policymakers, interested people, retirees, anyone who cares about fusion has always been sort of the problem. I think there needs to be a lot more work done. You've been in fusion for many decades, and you probably heard people say similar things five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. How good is the scientific community at educating the public about what's known, what's not known, what needs to be done? Well, I think they're not very good at it. I do think the big laboratories and universities do try, like Princeton and General Atomics and some of the large universities. They have outreach programs. They invite visits from, from high schools and so on, and they send their scientists out around to schools. So there is quite a bit of this going on, you know, not at the level that maybe one would like. They're not as good at communicating with reporters in the media. Uh, they do have distribution lists. Most of them have some type of a newsletter or posting on their website that's oriented towards progress and, and things that might interest the public press. There is some of this going on, probably not as effective. It isn't as effective as you'd like to be. A few years ago, a lady was hired at Princeton and came up with the idea that we should mount a multi-million dollar public relations effort that was professionally done, utilizing the advice and help 
of professional public relations people working with the outreach people and public affairs people at the sites. And so we had a big meeting and we talked to this all through and Princeton thought that they could raise millions of dollars from wealthy alumni to do all of this. You know, we wrote a charter and all of this. And uh, by the time they were done, a year later, almost nothing had happened. And then whether she got fired or she just left, I don't know, but the whole thing just died. And I don't know why it died. I think it was maybe overly ambitious. But also, Princeton didn't get the support that they needed from the other laboratories because each of the laboratories has their own little sphere of influence and people that are doing their own thing. And to ask them to all work together for one big public relations kind of diverted them from their own little sphere. For example, each site, like at Oak Ridge or General Atomics, their focus is on their immediate community because that's the easiest for them to access. So talking about a national campaign, they'd have to probably hire more people. And I don't know why this all couldn't work, but it didn't work. But I think Eater, they've got a big public relations act thing going, and they're doing it very well, and their target is all of Europe. They don't focus on other countries, and, and they don't focus on our public relations, but they seem to be doing a great job in Europe, and they have a very great success with a constituency in Europe. And I don't know about the other countries like Korea, China, and Japan. I have the feeling that they're uh, not as dependent on public opinion there as they are on government policy. Okay, that's a fair answer. I think that's, that's the last of my questions. Is there anything else you want to add on top of all the things you've already added? No, I appreciate your time to do this, and thanks for your hard work and your dedication. Okay. Thank you for the, your time. Appreciate it. Okay, Matt. Take it easy.